When I was in eighth grade, they asked each child to write a mission statement. I picked um, a quote from Philippine. Um, we cultivate a very small field for Christ, but we love it, knowing that God does not require great achievements, but a heart that holds back nothing for self. And so I picked that. And, um, you know, just thinking, oh, Philippine, you know, she's very important to our school, very important to me. And then I kind of wrote, you know, in my own words, what it meant to me as a 13-year-old girl. And um, I didn't realize how important that moment was because now that quote, oh my gosh, <laughs> that quote has carried me through high school, through college, through the decisions I made to, you know, leave the country and serve others, um, the decision that I'm making in eight days. She doesn't require that we, you know, are successful, like, in terms of money or have a lot of things, have, you know, lavish lifestyles. It's, it's that heart. I think about her all the time because, you know, she crossed borders. She broke barriers and kind of, it's kind of what I'm going to do. Through it all and what I think she continues to teach me today is simply being open to God's action in your life. It's, it's what's in front of you. All the odds were against her and she still like stuck to her goal and accomplished it. And like, that's what the foundation of our school is. Like we all aspire to be like Philippine. I feel like she must have been a real no nonsense kind of woman. <laughs> she knew that that's what God wanted her to do. And so she just said, I'm here. I do what you want with me, dear Lord. The year that those two women spent together uh, in 1804, 1805, I think, was the happiest that the two of them spent. I mean, it was a year of, of prayer. It was a year of, um, I think, really soulful friendship. Two women of very different temperaments and very different backgrounds, but they complemented one another in this very remarkable way. And of course, Sophie being the younger one, reigning in a lot of Philippines, very austere um, and monastic uh, inclinations. Um, I mean, it says a lot about Philippines' humility that she kind of knuckled under to the removal of the grills and all of these other things that Sophie wanted. And I think it must have killed Sophie to lose her to the new world. You know, so many congregations that were founded in Europe split off at some point when they got over to this country or to Latin America, wherever, out of Europe, for many different reasons. Sometimes it was expected that they would found a new congregation. Other times it was simply lack of communication. You know, I mean, you don't understand American culture, you know, whatever. And that never happened with us. And 
I, I am not alone in attributing it really to the relationship between Madeleine Sophie and Philippine. Philippine would never have thought of breaking off, never. I am where God wills me to be, and so I have found rest and security. His wisdom governs me, his power defends me, his grace sanctifies me, his mercy encompasses me, his joy sustains me, and all will go well with me. No matter where that journey is that God takes you, being present to him, being present to the path that he's laid out for you, whether it be bumpy, whether it be narrow, whether it be wide, whether it be smooth, keeping him present always is the lesson from these walls and is how you will grow and how our world will flourish. I really think it shows that she was devoted to God and she wouldn't let anything else get her mind off it. I love Philippine. I think what I love about her most is her humanity. You know, she, we see her as such a strong and valiant woman, but actually, you know, her, her sense of herself was a very, you know, I think she called herself a worn out stick or something like that one time. And um, she knew her need of God. I think that we in our world need, need to listen to the heartbeat of God yeah. in the vulnerable and in and the edges, in the margins, and in the depth of our hearts, and we don't do it often enough. And if we did it the way Philippine did it, because that's what she did when she sat for hours in prayer, she was listening to the heartbeat of God and to God's whisper in the depth of who she was. That's what allows us to reveal the face of God to each other. We may not understand his will for us in time, but in eternity the veil will be drawn and we shall see that he acted only for our happiness. I can only imagine what it was like for her in 1800 to say, I want to go to this unknown land. Jeez, you know, I don't know where I'm going really. I don't know what it's going to be like, but somehow God wants me there. And okay, I'm going to get up and go, I'm begging Madeline Sophie to let her go. So she struggled mightily by choice to do something she felt needed to be done. And that to me is an independent woman. The fact that she got on that boat alone as a fairly old woman for her time to go to an unknown land uh, to do work she felt called to do but had no real view of what would happen. And to step into that boldly and confidently um, that's what I want graduates of Sacred Heart to leave and do. I mean, we know that she was armed with a very, very strong faith and knew that God would, would pull her through, and obviously he did. There's no age limit for living a dream or doing a good work or, you know, living, you know, an adventure. The internationality that is sustained to this day based on one woman's vision is just truly remarkable. We have this entire school, we've got Villa, we've got like every other school, Sacred Heart School, because she came all the way over here and did that for us. I was struck by this sense of like, wow, Philippine was like, really didn't just like come on a ship and bring a French thing here. She kind of made a sacred heart and American thing. There was a way in which Philippine was like, she was like really American. You know, like she was a, like a, you know, a pioneer. She went like way out to the frontier. And, you know, as an immigrant, she was like that kind of ideal of, of what we think of as an American. I remember having a really profound spiritual experience in that chapel and just really feeling a sense of, um, 
I don't know, a sense that like in this place and in this time, there's there's like work to do, and that Philippines saw the work of Sacred Heart in the context of the American project as something really unique and special. The idea that she opened a free school and like the first free school west of the Mississippi, and the idea that we here have a, you know, we're you know obviously private Catholic institutions, but. There's a broader purpose to our work and a public purpose to our work. St. Philippine is one of our biggest role models here. I mean, our school's slogan, is, I can call it our school's slogan, is um, Girls Without Limits. And so to hear St. Philippine's story and to hear how big her dreams were and how she kept on trying to reach them no matter how long it took is really inspiring for us because you know we really realized that if you have a dream and you really want it like you do anything you can to reach it humility is the virtue that requires the greatest amount of effort it took me a while to sort of warm up to Philippine, but then going to Florissant um, and seeing the incredible, incredible courage it took. I mean, she was not young, and she had she had was raised, you know, she was raised in a very wealthy, she had a very wealthy background, and then comes to this situation. Um, had to just start from, you know, a true pioneer woman. You know, she'd get up in the middle of the night and do the, the mending and whatever. The space under the stairs where she lived, <laughs> I just think, the sacrifice. Simple duties daily done. And I think that's Philippine. She lived, I believe, very much in the present what needed to be. I just love the fact that I think of her as this present go-getter, uh, wanting to serve um, God's people, and always itching to be with the Native Americans. And there she was with these frontiersmen. But I think the fact that she spent so much of her personal time in prayer and reflection really helped her to see clearly about what was present and what was the next step. I think one of Philippines' uh, greatest virtues was humility. I think Philippine wanted to know what true humility was because I think that is one of the things about following Jesus is to understand that humility. Because of that, there was great suffering. and. Uh, she knew the cross in many ways that most people did not. When I look at her life, not just when she came to, you know, to the United States, but her whole life and what it cost her to leave her family, to leave Sophie, you know, to, to leave people all for the sake of the mission. And then to get here and it's not, she's not a success. I think she died thinking that she had failed. And um, that's part of her legacy. And yet, at the same time, everything we have in many ways, uh, not just in the United States, but you know, when we celebrate this bicentennial, we are celebrating the missionary spirit of the society, which we owe to her. Humility really calls on one to, to first off acknowledge and be grateful for the gifts that God at one has been given, but also seek to use those gifts to the best of their abilities in serving God. And I think that's, the best way to describe uh, Philippines. She left a very comfortable life, right? And came to the frontier of the new world. She, I think, is, a, is an example of how we can do just fine with less. I think that's just something for us to aspire to, that idea that you don't need to keep acquiring. And, then, and sometimes at some point, maybe in middle age, it's good to start shedding and letting go of all of those kind of false idols. You may dazzle the mind with a thousand billion discoveries 
of natural science. You may open new worlds of knowledge which were never dreamed of before. Yet, if you have not developed in the soul of the pupil strong habits of virtue, which will sustain her in the struggle of life, you have not educated her, but only put in her hand a powerful instrument of self-destruction. The education world is finally catching on to just how important character is, and they always thought that intelligence, things like IQ, were the most important for your future success. And now we have research that says your character is much more predictive of your future success than even your IQ. And so I think it's humbling to remember that we need to get back to these basics of, of developing really strong characters and, and souls. I know that we're a new frontier for the network, but I think Josephina is in, you know, has traveled new frontiers in lots of ways for um, Sacred Heart schools and non-Sacred Heart schools. The new frontier we're on is that we're offering the IB program to our students wall-to-wall, -wall, meaning every student in the 11th and 12th grade are enrolled in one of the most challenging academic programs in the world. And a lot of schools do this in a way where they test into it. It's their honors program. But for us, the idea that access to a challenging and rigorous curriculum is so important for our students. We decided that we're gonna give them all the opportunity to enter into the program, and then it's our job to figure out how to support them through it. She has her mindset for some, like at one, or like at a goal or so, she goes for it. Like she doesn't second guess it, she just goes mm -hmm. for it. And that, that I think that's what, in a way, shaped us as Josefina, in a way, because they help us, like, they acknowledge that we have goals, and then they they push us. Like, if there's certain stuff that we want to do, they will make sure like we go in that mm -hmm. path. They know it's gonna help you because they know your goals already. Because they know how like what type of person you are, and mm -hmm. what you, you want to do in like in life. And that's what Filipina did. She, like she went for it. Like she's like, okay, I want to do this. I want to be a missionary. I want to do this. I want to help this. I want to do that. And that's what she did. And I think that's what she like. She's one brave woman. Okay. <laughs>
of uh, faith and prayer. We had three Potawatomi come to our last committee meeting. It was so cool. Sister Virginia talked about her great-grandmother learning how to pray from Philippine. I mean, and they, everybody that I've talked to, not just these three, but I've been in touch with others, there is such affection for Philippine. It's amazing that they, the word has been passed down within their community, and they talked about a lot of little things that she taught them and, and um, that they learned from her. We wanted to know from them how best can we honor their love for her and her deep affection for them during, during the bicentennial. The thing that they wanted us to know was that every five years, they reenact the trail of death when the Potawatomi were pushed from uh, southern Indiana across through and to Sugar Creek and Mound City. And along the trail, many people died. There were a few births. There were other events. And there are markers. And they end up at uh, the shrine in Mound City. And, um, and they said they would love to have us join them. What we can take away from her experience and her determination is to reach out to those around us who maybe we would not have felt comfortable doing or would not have been in our immediate circles. She wasn't coming to save the day. She was coming to interact with these people and to truly have an interdependent relationship with them. Philippine Duchenne's way of coming to the United States and being with the Potawatomi was about her presence and understanding them. It wasn't about her imposition of Catholicism on them. And because of that, they developed this relationship in which they were both nourished. And um, I think that's what young people, in particular young Catholic people, are trying to figure out how to make sense out of a church that, quite frankly, is largely not speaking to them. And I think um, Philippine, Sophie, um, the Sacred Heart, if, if talked about appropriately, can in fact engage them in a way of being in the world. Um, and I think Philippine's the model for that, just simply going, praying, being still, and watching. The dear Lord has favored us with a share of his cross. The greatest and undoubtedly the hardest to bear is the lack of success in our work here. If a saint had been in charge, all would have gone well. That's wonderful. Well, it's just a different type of feeling from school to school, but this school really has its special touch because we have Philippines uh, sarcophagus right here. So we really just, it's more of just like a holier place. And you can tell through the classes that the teachers are all more respectful of actual, like the Philippine burial ground. We all talk about walking in her footsteps here, and we do. I told the sixth graders how lucky I think they are to be attending this school and to know Philippines so intimately, because we do. This is like living in grandma's house here. I was thinking about Philippine, um, and recently, uh, last uh, summer, I was in uh, the St. Charles area, and I actually saw where St. Philippine used to sleep underneath a stairway. I've seen the room in which she died, and I've been to her shrine. And when you take all those three items together, you realize that her love continues, and her sense of adventure and sense of mission to make sure that, in her era, that any child could be educated, whether they had the means, any child, uh, even the Indians, the Potawatomi Indians. So it's just very special that it's 200 years that we're celebrating her in this way. And it's really more an experience of entering into sacred space. And I think anybody that works here, um, I think even the children could identify with it. It's, uh, it's finding that niche, that finding that nook, finding that space here at the school, whether it's a shrine, whether it's the front yard, whether it's in the presence of the roundhouse, whether it's one of the classrooms. There is a spiritual presence here, and I don't mean that to sound superficial in, in any sense. There is a calm, a quiet, 
that if you open yourself to, to it is incredibly influential. What she experienced and what she went through um, and what she embraced willingly here to, to start this school, to um, give a foundation here in North America for the Society of the Sacred Heart, it's a call, a challenge, and a, a great um, responsibility for all of us that are continuing now. I think for me, it was just, it's a blessing to be the eyes, the ears, the hands of Philippine and carrying on her work is such a gift and a blessing. And when I look out at the students and you realize sometimes I, you think it will happen and occur and you know that it's her leading you to do it. And that just has been a true blessing to be able to share that. When you walk through these hallways with a friend, you're silent. It's just, we are walking where Philippines walking and it is just known you are where Philippine is and was. And it's just, it's something incredible and you can't, you just want to take it all in. You don't want to talk over it. She was a, a rock of stability and fidelity to the original spirit, which she took on fully, um, and maintained that prayer, the base of all activity, and never forgot it, you know, and was a pioneer. God chose her as the seed which bore tremendous fruit in the United States. This continent, this country, still maintains the schools as a strong uh, rock of our work, of our apostolate. Strength of character is certainly needed to face life in the world and to stand by right principles, especially in the age in which we live. Of course, all of us were, grew so close to Philippine Duchenne, and we were all taught of her great um, sacrifices and her desire to serve the underserved, and how it didn't work for her so many times. So it all came back to me when the Sisters of Christian Charity asked if I would be interested in helping them with their school in the inner city that was about to close. Because of her, I took it on. I made sort of a pact with the dear Lord and said, well, if you'll lead me, I will go. And Philippine Duchenne was, had one hand and the dear Lord had the other hand. And off we went. It's been really a 32-year journey of faith, really, because it's way over my head. And I just marvel at her and marvel at what I call the miracle of Josephina. You know, at, at uh, night or your prayer time, I think of, you know, what a good job she did. And I think she'd be so happy with this. I wish she'd come back down and we could walk her around, you know, and meet these girls. Uh, but then I think, okay, what's the next step? And now I think I better go hide under a staircase and sleep there at night. <laughs> so I have a lot to go. Philippine, I'll do that someday. <laughs> I think her spirit is alive and well here in Atherton, you know? And I think if it wasn't for Philippine, you know, and having someone like that to look at and to model after, I don't know if the school would be in the position it is today, simply put. I mean, she was a rock, a strength for so many people, and I feel like we, we in Atherton are the recipients of her gifts to the society. You know, we need to graduate men and women who have a moral compass, that they know who they are, they know their purpose in life. And I think just like Philippine, who was driven to leave Europe, to come to the new world, I think our graduates have that same drive. They have that same spark. Uh, we would say maybe they have a fire in their belly um, where there's no boundaries. I mean, that's the, the whole celebration of Philippine is removing frontiers or crossing frontiers. I think our graduates do that uh, day in and day out. They found their voice and they're not afraid to share it. I think that makes Philippine really proud. And that's the great thing about sacred art education, whether it's in Nebraska or Uganda, is this whole sense that um, 
We don't study Philippine and Sophie like historical figures. Uh, they're not just saints on a pedestal. They're real people to us and real examples. And we take their virtue and their practices and we make them our own. And so it's not just uh, caught up in the sanctity of, of the two, but really the real life experience and how we can incorporate that and live it. I think that's the way we're being most honest to our mission of who those great women were. You know, I know that um, that Philippine is very near and dear uh, to the mission and work of Josephinum Academy. Um, in some ways, I consider her our patroness in that, um, you know, Philippine was called to carry the love of Christ and the mission of Sacred Heart education to new frontiers. Today, how we recognize that the margin that so many are up against, the obstacle, is affordability. If you're born uh, with limited resources uh, and you're born into certain zip codes, the local public option can leave you wanting. When it's your mission to create educational opportunity, uh, and especially to ensure the affordability of it, it's easy to feel like there's never enough because the need is seemingly insurmountable. And uh, often the needs that our students come with can leave us wondering if we're enough to meet them as well. And you know, I, I think that service on the frontier calls us to a depth of faith, um, a reservoir, if you will, um, of knowing that what we have is enough and enough to share. And that if we welcome our students with open arms and with trust and with faith, the service we offer is enough. One of the really positive images, is, images that we draw from the idea of the frontier is that this is a focus not on where we've been, but on where we're going. And uh, our students often have come to us having experienced great hardship. Uh, you know, suffering beyond their measure. And we're careful while to acknowledge and accept their experience and um, to really value that experience. Here, our focus is on the future and on the present, but uh, it's about where are you going and where is the opportunity for you to grow. Each day, our students come to us from 46 different zip codes. You know, they themselves are pioneers. 75% uh, are the first generation in their family to have the opportunity to attend college. And it's their example that I believe is what is most inspirational and is the key connection for the adult community of Josephinum. Because when you see the lengths that they're ready to go to, you can't help but be inspired and ask yourself, what are the margins or frontiers of my own growth? And how can I draw from their courage and confidence to have the same in my own life? This is why I think Sacred Heart is so, Sacred Heart education is so important in today's world. Because, and I don't think it will ever not be important. It was, it was born in the time after the French Revolution when there was so much horror and terror and, and, and ugliness and um, crassness. And it was born out of that as, as a movement that was meant to help people realize that they're lovable and that they're inherently OK and that they, they that regardless of what happens in the exterior world, that does not determine your value or your worth or your lovableness, that there's a core inside of you that's just solid. And that was an aspect of Sacred Heart education. It's to, to the mission of the Society of the Sacred Heart is to help people discover, i.e. know, the love of the heart of Christ, God's love. She would probably just tell us, you know what, just keep going, just keep going. I think she'd be out there last Saturday marching. I, I think she would probably be, um advocating with these tech people around here, how can we use these educational tools to reach people that aren't, aren't here? She would have been the first one at the computer. <laughs> I think she'd be walking up and down the halls, silence, and through her presence, she would be teaching us all. I think she would still be teaching. People forget we're back there, I think, at the boys' school. Um, but I think she'd be, she wouldn't forget that we're back there. I picture her like 
a CEO of a company, like just like standing there in a suit and being like a really like powerful woman. I think she'd be the one out there like physically building the boys' school. Yeah. yeah. Yes. She'd be visiting people who could give her money. She would be fighting for immigrants and she would be fighting for the downtrodden. She, she, she'd probably be a high-level professional by now without any salary, of but, course. Or she would be doing what she, she did. She would be founding schools mm -hmm. to train other people to do that. She will be praying and she will be inspiring us to do the best and to go forward. She'd probably be pretty with the times. You know, I can see her with an iPhone, you know, running the Facebook page, all that good stuff. I feel like she'd be a person to keep everyone organized. I think she'd be right in there with Pope, with the Pope. I, I think she'd look for that new frontier. I think that she would be a friend to anybody who entered the school and she would treat everybody the same with God's love and with genuine care. So I imagine she'd be telling us like to keep, like look, don't look like at your own just like borders, don't look at your own neighbors, like look past it. Where are we not touching right now? What can we do to help those who are less fortunate? She could be the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. I'm wonderfully satisfied with those kids letting their light shine like that and, and stepping out in the world prepared. She'd be praying and she'd be praying all night what she'd be doing. We have um, this image that maybe intergenerational groups or alums or groups of RSCJ or whatever, people will sit down wherever they are in small groups with a map of their city on the lap and say, if Philippine came to my city, where would she want me to serve with her? <laughs>